break? Didn't um, you, you know how it goes. Uh, uh, it, it was there were no students around, so it was a break. But uh, <laughs> but other than that, uh, I'm much like yours, I'm sure. Yeah, that's good. Well, maybe maybe we'll maybe we'll start things off. Um, and 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 welcome to everybody. I, I think maybe a few more people will sign in as 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 time goes on. But it's a real pleasure today to introduce Dr. Shin Kui, and 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 Dr. Kui is is now a postdoctoral uh, research associate at a MIT, and he's working. He's he's very lucky to work with Professor Herbert Einstein um, in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And he also has been working with Dr. Camilla, Camilla uh, Catania um, in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences. Now, before joining MIT, uh, Shin uh, received his PhD from the University of Hong Kong, and that was in the field of rock mechanics. And, and at the present time, his research focuses on using different numerical methods, and that includes boundary element, finite element, finite volume, et cetera, et cetera, to simulate geomechanical processes. And we'll hear about some of those today. So it's it's my pleasure to turn the proceedings over to Dr. Shin Kui. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this seminar. Uh, I'm Xin Cui, as I uh, just introduced. I'm now a postdoc at MIT. Uh, it's my pleasure to have this opportunity to share my research here. And today I'm going to share uh, how to simulate 3D flash propagation under one, two, and three mixed mode loaded conditions. So before we dive into the topic today, let me first briefly introduce my research interests. So overall, my research centers around the ge geomechanical processes in geothermal exploitation. So in the past few years, I'll focus on those uh, following four subtopics. The first one is the properties of rock material under high temperature. Uh, by high, high temperature here, I mean it's around 200 degrees C, which is in the range of geothermal exploitation. The second topic is 3D fracture propagation, which is highly relevant to geothermal uh, exploitation, the hydraulic fracturing. And third topic is the thermal hydromechanical coupling, uh, which is obvious in geothermal exploitation. And also the injection induced seismicity, which is a major concern and risk uh, if a large amount of fluid is injected underground. So the outline of today's talk, I'll start with the difference between 2D and 3D fracture propagation. So you understand what parameters we need to consider if we want to simulate 3D fracture propagation. And then I'll uh, briefly introduce the Skolman criteria uh, and you understand the rationale to predict 3D uh, fracture propagation. Then I'll briefly introduce the DDM, displacement discontinuity method, which is the numerical method I used in this study and explain the drawbacks of the stress intensity factor based Skolman criteria and why we need to turn to the stress based Skolman criteria and how we can combine those two to develop a new algorithm to simulate 3D fracture propagation. And next I will provide some examples uh, to demonstrate the application of this new algorithm. And finally, I'll uh, touch on different ways to solve the hydromechanical coupling equations in the context of hydraulic fracturing. So you probably know uh, there's three different loaded modes to drive the propagation fractures. So the mode one is opening, mode two is in-plane shear, mode three is out-plane shear. So they correspond to uh, SIFs K1, K2, and K3 respectively. So in the 2D case, Usually we do not consider most reloading. So you can see all of those cases, basically we need to consider this kink angle, the angle between the previous fracture plane and the new fracture plane. So uh, overall for 2D cases, the geometry is relatively simple, but it's more complex in 3D case. So you can see those schematics and also the experimental results. So in the 3D case, we not only need to consider this kink angle, we also need to consider this twist angle. And if it's uh, a one, two, and three mixed mode load condition, the new fracture surface is curved. So we have to find a way to accurately capture this curved surface. So this is a major difference between 2D and 3D uh, fracture propagation. So the Skolman criteria is a 3D fracture propagation criteria, which can help us to locate the new fracture surface. 
So, you know, there are many different uh, failure criteria to predict fracture propagation and uh, the SCOMA criteria is just one of them. So in general, for any failure criteria, it has to answer the following three questions. First one is, when does the propagation initiate and along which direction? And third question is, how far away would the fracture propagate? So actually the third uh, question is associated with the first one. I'll come back to this later on. So there are many very classical uh, 2D failure criteria. So for example, this maximum tensile stress uh, criteria, we can set up a local coordinate system at the fracture tip and calculate this uh, sigma theta theta uh, using this equation. And the fracture propagation uh, occurs along the direction where this uh, sigma theta theta takes the maximum value. And the fracture starts to propagate if this equation, the maximum value of this sigma theta theta is equal to this value. So that's the uh, classic 2D maximum tensile stress criteria. So let's turn to the 3D Skolman criteria. So the essence of this criteria is looking for the local maximum tensile stress. So suppose that this is a 3D fracture front we can set up a local coordinate system, cylindrical coordinate system at a specific uh, phi angle. Phi angle here is a kinky angle. You can see all those different uh, stress components. Actually, we can calculate those uh, stress components analytically reported in this paper. So, so at a specific value of phi, if those all those stress components are known, we can calculate the uh, major principal stress in this highlighted plane. And so under this specific value of phi, sigma one should be the maximum tensile stress. You know, as this uh, phi, phi angle changes, the major principal uh, stress sigma one also changes. So we can look for the maximum value of this sigma one, which is satisfied by this equation. So by solving this equation, we can solve the uh, uh, king angle phi naught. So under this uh, uh, criteria, this Goldman criteria, the twist angle is defined as the included angle between sigma two and the sigma uh, z, or the angle between sigma one and sigma phi. So because we know all of, of those stre uh, stretch components, we can easily calculate this angle between those between the sigma one and the sigma phi. So that's how we obtain the twist angle and the kink angle. So those two angles can answer the question along which direction would the fracture propagate. So we also need to answer the question, when does the propagation initiate? So this is the major principal stress using all those stress components. As I described previously, all those stress components can be calculated to the using the uh, analytical expressions. If we uh, substitute all those analytical uh, expressions into this equation, we can get this one. And we can also borrow the idea from 2D maximum tensile stress using this equation again. So the sigma one, which is the ma uh, local maximum tensile stress is equal to a critical value, which is equal to this one, uh, the pressure starts to propagate. So we can combine those two equations and then I define such an equivalent SIF KV. So we can compare the magnitude of KV and the KIC. If KV is greater than KIC, the fracture will propagate. If KV is less than KIC, the fracture won't propagate. If the two are equal, which means the fracture is in a critical state. So, however, if we apply this condition to calculate the uh, kink angle, uh, where sigma one takes the maximum value, we can get this one. Although we all know the values of K1, K2, and K3, so you know this the equation is very complex. It's not straightforward to get the value of phi naught. To visualize the, uh, the solution, the authors define this like the coordinate system. So the K1, K2, and the K3 are normalized with respect to KIC. So here each uh, point actually is a set of co coordinates and each point corresponds to a specific phi angle and a phi angle. So we can refer to those diagrams to uh, get the value of phi and uh, Pusai at a, a specific coordinate. And we can also calculate the KV. Its KV is below this surface. It's the, the crack won't propagate. It's, if it's above this surface, the crack will propagate. So this is like a failure envelope. However, you know, if we use those diagrams, it's not convenient to calculate those parameters. 
play around Richard, uh, just fit those uh, surfaces, use those three equations. So you, you can see after the fitting, uh, those three parameters are calculated explicitly by SIF by substituting all those coefficients into the three equations. So next, I will briefly introduce the DDM and uh, explain the drawbacks of the SIF-based SCOMA criteria and why we need to turn to the stress-based uh, SCOMA criteria. So, you know, there are, ma there are many different ways to simulate fracture propagation like FEM, DEM, phase field, or BM. But today I'm gonna use a displacement discontinuity method and it's one type of BM. So for those who are not familiar with DDM, here I'd like to give a brief introduction to, to this method. So suppose there is a source at a receiver and at the source, there, there's some kind of perturbation and the perturbation is defined as follows. So here we can have a normal perturbation, a normal displacement discontinuity or a tangential displacement discontinuity. So physically, the normal displacement discontinuity represents the opening of fractures and this tangential displacement discontinuity represents the sliding between the fracture phases. So if there is a perturbation, we can calculate the induced stress or displacement some distance R away from this source uh, using this the green function. So this F function is related to green function. So suppose there's many different sources because this is a linear elastic problem. We can sum all those influences uh, together. So we just take the sum to calculate the induced stresses or displacements by all of those sources. So if we consider another case, there is a triangular element and the displacement discontinuity dx, dy, and dz are constant over this uh, uh, triangular element. And to calculate the induced uh, stress or displacement, we have to integrate this green function over this area. So that's why we have this equation. Uh, and if we go one step further more, there are many different elements. We just need to add all those uh, elements together to consider the contribution of each element. So we got this equation. So the stresses or displacements at the receivers are usually boundary conditions. So we have this equation on the left-hand side and the boundary condition on the right-hand side. Finally, we end up with this equation, the coefficient matrix times the uh, displacement discontinuity, which is equal to the boundary condition. So we solve this equation to get the primary unknowns, the D. So here I want to introduce this code, DDF as 3D, which was developed by me and my advisor during my PhD. So, and the displacement discontinuity method is included in this code. So those are the key features of this code. So it's open source. And um, in this code, both the constant triangular elements and quadrilateral elements are available. And uh, because, uh, you know, here we have, we have to calculate the, uh, the coefficient matrix. So in this code, uh, both numerical and analytical integration um, are available to calculate the coefficients, which is very uh, robust. And the CPU acceleration is in place to accelerate the calculation. So you can see all those examples are you know, the simulation results by this code. So a penny shape crack, uh, a Brazilian disk, and a Brazilian disk with a central flaw. So you may ask, why do we use a DDM? So there are two main reasons. First, under DDM, we only mesh fractures. There is no elements elsewhere. So we can uh, simulate fracture propagation simply by adding new elements to the front, like shown here. So it's very simple. But in other cases, like in FEM, it's not, not that trivial because in FEM, you, usually we have to rematch the region ahead of this uh, front. So that's a little bit complex. The second reason is we can easily calculate the near field stresses or SIFs. So you can see those equations. In those, those equations, the D and DS, DT are the displacement discontinuities of the uh, element situated at the fracture front. So all those parameters are constants. And the, after we get the uh, displacement discontinuities, we can immediately calculate the K1, K2, and the K3. But I want to highlight this parameter, Kase, which is an empirical parameter. Uh, because uh, you know, the real fracture tip is sharp, but here we are using the constant elements, which means we use those triangle 
uh, triangles to approximate this sharp tip. So you can see uh, at the tip position, it's not accurate. That being said, if we, if we use those equations, it's simple to calculate SIFs, but it's somewhat not accurate. And the parameter can say here is used to make correction. Now we can combine uh, Stoneman criteria and uh, DDM since we can easily obtain the SIFs and use those two equations, we can calculate the kink and twist angles. This can uh, answer the question along which direction uh, the fracture will propagate. And also we can calculate the uh, equivalent SIF by comparing K uh, KV and KIC. We can know uh, when the uh, fracture will start propagate. But the next question we need to answer is how far away uh, would the fracture propagate? So suppose this is the uh, previous fracture front and now KV is greater than KIC, which means the fracture is about to propagate, right? And the fracture will propagate to a position where KV is equal to KIC. So you can see all those red arrows, those are the propagation distances we need to calculate. So in this paper, the authors suggested this equation, use this uh, simple equation to roughly estimate the propagation distance. We also adopt this equation to estimate the propagation distance. So after that, we can add new elements to the previous fresh front and solve the whole model to calculate the displacement discontinuities of those tip elements. So after that, we can calculate the SIFs for each tip element and then the equivalent SIF. So we can then compare the value of KV at KIC. Usually this equation does not hold because we are using an estimation, it's not accurate. So we need to adjust the propagation or distance. For example, here, uh, the KV is less than KIC. So we need to reduce the propagation distance to make the KV a bit, a bit, a bit larger. Here, KV is greater than KIC. So we need to increase the propagation distance so the KV can be a smaller. So uh, this equation is used to adjust the propagation distance. You know, uh, after the adjustment, we can redo the calculation and calculate the SFs again and compare KV and KIC uh, one, one more time. So we actually loop around between step two and step five until this purple line uh, overlap with this dash line. So on this dash line, KV is equal to KIC everywhere. So we can use this uh, simple uh, example to test the idea above. So this is the penny shape crack under compression. And the azimuth angle is here, you can see here. And the range is minus 180 to positive 180, which basically means all of the tip elements. And the vertical axis here is the uh, equivalent SIF. And the KIC line is here. And here I show uh, an error, um, error tolerance band, which is 2%. So you can see before the iterations, this red line is here. So at some positions, the equivalent SIF is greater than the KIC, but at other places, the uh, equivalent KIC is less than KIC. But as the number of iterations uh, increases, this line gradually falls down. And after 12 iterations, uh, this line falls into this arrow band, which means numer numerically, we think we will obtain the new fracture uh, front on which KV is equal, equal to KIC. But there are a few drawbacks of the SIF-based Skolman criteria. First, as I just described, it, it requires system-level iterations. In the uh, example I showed in the last slide, uh, it takes 12 iterations to uh, reach convergence. So it's computationally expensive. And th there's also interaction between the neighboring elements. For example, here, if I adjust the propagation distance of this element, it's gonna influence the element next to it. Usually, uh, this can you know, cause the iteration not converge. And the situation is even worse because SIFs are sensitive to the shape of the tip elements. As I just described, there is a empirical parameter to calibrate this K K1, K2, and uh, K3. Uh, it turns out this parameter is related to different factors, such as element size or shape, as I show here. You can see those two neighboring elements, they're, they're of different size, and those two elements, they're different uh, shapes. Uh, so 
if we use SIF based discriminant criteria, first, it's not efficient because we have to perform system level iterations. And it's not robust because the SIFs are not accurate if we use the uh, tip elements to custom elements. But under DDM, we can actually calculate a very accurate stress if we go a little bit further away from the fracture tip. Here I show a penny shaped crack uh, subject to inner pressure. We calculate the, uh, the stress normal to this fracture plane. So here is the fracture front. You can see uh, very close to the fracture front, there is a big difference between the numerical value and the analytical uh, uh, solution. But if we go a little bit further away, the accuracy improves very fast. So the question is, can we use stresses instead of uh, SIFs to do the simulation? The answer is yes. So, you know, the key idea of the Skolman criteria here is looking for the maximum local tensile stress. So instead of use those two cal uh, equations to calculate, use SIFs to calculate the kink angle and twist angle, we can directly numerically search for the maximum tensile stress. So we can set up a, lo a local coordinate system because it's unlikely for the fracture to go backwards. So we just need to analyze this semi uh, circle. We can divide this semi circle into um, different nodes and then calculate the major principal stress at those different locations. We can then compare the M different major principal stresses and pick up the maximum value. So which gives us the uh, kink, uh, twist and kink angle and the twist angle. So based on stresses, we can get more accurate um, uh, kink angle and a twist angle. And in terms of the propagation distance, let's take a look at this criteria again. So this tells us if it's in a critical state, uh, our distance away from the fracture tip, there, the, the maximum tensile stress is equal to a critical value, which is key, uh, which is a sigma 1c, so as I shown here. So if kV is greater than kIc, which means the fracture is about to propagate, and uh, the R distance away from the tip, sigma 1 has to be uh, greater than uh, sigma 1c. So then the fracture starts to propagate by some distance. And so the KV is equal to KIC again. And if we go away, R distance, uh, go R distance away from the new tip, the sigma 1 should be equal to sigma 1c again. If we use the uh, SIF based scoring criteria, we have to add new elements to the previous fresh tip because without new elements, we cannot obtain a KV. So that's why we need how to perform iterations. However, it's unnecessary if you use stresses. Although KV is equal to KIC, we can go even further away to a point where sigma one is equal to sigma one C. So this extra, extra distance can be quantified the propagation uh, distance D. So, you know, if we use stresses, it's, it's not required to carry out system level iterations. So this is really efficient. So those two figures compare the difference between the SIF-based Skolman criteria and the stress-based uh, Skolman criteria. So previously we start with this purple line and uh, by iterations, those purple line gradually approaches this uh, dash line. And on this dash line, KV is equal to KIC. But in the stress-based uh, stress Skolman criteria, we directly calculate this distance. And uh, um, on this uh, dashed curve, sigma one is equal to sigma one C. We, we no longer use KV as the criteria by using this uh, stresses. So this is more efficient and robust. So here's a flow of how to uh, determine the uh, new fracture front. So suppose this is a, a element situated at the previous fracture front, and the point O is the midpoint of AB side. By set up a, a local coordinate system and uh, searching for numerically searching for the uh, maximum local tensile stress, we can determine the twist angle and uh, the kink angle and also the twist angle. And after that. Uh, suppose that this is uh, element A, B, C again. Suppose we can, uh, there's a propagation distance. We can move this A, B side along the X axis by the distance D and then rotate uh, this line 
uh, around this or uh, one axis by this kink angle phi naught. So we, we can get uh, DE line. And in the plane perpendicular to O, o prime, we can uh, rotate an angle for psi naught, which is a twist angle to get A prime, B prime. We then can adjust the distance D to make the uh, major principal stress here is equal to the critical value. So now A prime, B prime should be situated on the new fracture front. So by doing this for all of the uh, tip elements, we can get this line, the new fracture uh, front. But as you can see here, there's a problem because we got a series of line segments. And if we directly connect them and use this as the new fracture uh, front, so this is the, is the exact polyline. But we want to use, uh, we should fit a smooth curve instead of this uh, polyline. So the next step is we have to fit a smooth curve in the 3D base based on those data points. So we can use the uh, least square uh, to fit the curve. Uh, suppose those are data points we got. And we can uh, assume uh, three parametric equations to approximate those data points. And then uh, take the difference between those two data points, between those two sets of data points and squared and sum them up. So we can uh, calculate the minimum value of the, this S to finish this uh, curve fitting. So here's an example uh, to show the uh, result. Suppose I have 10 data points, like one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to up to 10. So this is the polyline before the fitting. And after fitting, I will get a smooth curve. So this figure also shows how we get, get the new uh, elements on the uh, uh, based on the previous fresh front. So this red line is the previous fresh front. And this blue line is the new fresh front without a uh, curve fitting. And this, uh, this pink line is the new fresh front after curve fitting. So once we get this pink line, we can add new elements to the previous fresh front. So we finish um, the simulation of one step of fresh propagation. So those are the steps of this algorithm. So first, we can numerically search for the maximum local uh, tensile stress. Uh, this is, gives us the kink and the twist angles. We can then calibrate the propagation distance to make the sigma one is equal to the critical value. And uh, we can then get a new zigzag fresh front. Uh, and then we need to carry out the curve fitting process to get a smooth front. Uh, after obtaining this uh, smooth front, we can add new elements to the previous front. So and finish one step of propagation. If there's many steps of propagation, we can redo this process. So here I would provide a few examples. So the first one is the penny shape crack under tension. So the initial crack is a penny shape crack and those are new fracture surfaces. In this figure, uh, the vertical axis is the far field tensile stress, and the horizontal axis is actually the length of the new fracture surface. Here, the distance r normalized by r can uh, represent the size of the new fracture surface. So you can see in this example, as the size of the uh, fracture increases, the far field tensile stress actually decreases. And the second example is the penny shape crack under compression. So yes, this is a very classic uh, schematic. So if it's under compression, the uh, most three load dominates here. This will result in, uh, result in a series of petal cracks. Uh, in current algorithm, there's no way to determine uh, how many uh, petal cracks beforehand. So I have to predefine the number of petal cracks. So just to demonstrate the capability of this new algorithm, I use one petal cracks on each side of, um, on each side. So again, this is not a real, uh, this is not to simulate a real case, it's just to demonstrate uh, how the uh, code performs. The third case is a hydraulic fracture um, experiment under one and three mixed mode loading. So this is, this schematic shows the experimental setup. So the cylindrical uh, specimen, and there's a central initial crack. 
and fluid is injected into this crack to provide more warm loading. And at the same time, a torque is applied at its bottom, which provide which provides mode three loading. So actually this crack is under mode one and mode uh, three mixed mode loading conditions. So this is a uh, experiment, experimental results. So the initial uh, crack and those fragments propagated from the initial crack and also the side view. And uh, this is a simulation uh, results. You can see uh, we can like reproduce the overlap between those fragments as you can see here. Well, finally, I'll uh, explain the different ways to solve the hydromechanical coupling uh, equations uh, in hydraulic fracturing. So, you know, there are two uh, equations that govern this process, the stress equilibrium and the mass conservation. If we use DDM to approximate the stress equation, we'll get this one the uh, coefficient matrix times the, the mm, displacement discontinuities is equal to uh, the far field stress plus in the normal dire direction we have here the flow pressure. Uh, for simplicity, let's consider there's no uh, far field stress, which means Sx and S1 are zero and the dx d1 are zero. So in this case, this equation reduced to this one, the uh, coefficient matrix times the uh, displacement discontinuity in normal direction is equal to P, uh, here P. But for the second equation, I use FEM to approximate it. So, you know, in the context of DDM, the uh, unknown is situated at the center of the element, but in uh, FEM, the unknowns are situated at the vertices of the element. So to um, calculate the uh, flow pressure at the center of the element, I have to do the in, um, interpolation, like uh, to do uh, here, n is the shape function times uh, p is, is the, p is the uh, flow pressure at the, those nodes. So this is basically to uh, calculate the uh, flow pressure at the center of this element. So, for the mass conservation, if we consider the rock matrix is impermeable, and we have this Gaumann equation, and uh, we use FEM to approximate this equation. So you can see here the weight function, and uh, here we use the cubic law to calculate the hydraulic conductivity. And again, we, uh, we can use the node elements uh, to interpolate the values inside the element. So this is a standard FEM approximation. After some manipulation, we get this one, the equation. And all those matrices can be calculated this way. So basically, uh, in the context of hydraulic fracture, we need to solve those two equations simultaneously. So there are two different ways to solve those two coupled equations. It, uh, it can be staggered or monolithic. So in the staggered solution scheme, we, we can separate the two uh, equations. We can provide the initial value of flow pressure. So the right hand side, on the right hand side, this value is known. So we can solve this equation for the uh, normal displacement discontinuity dz. So after sol after getting dz, we can do a weighted combination between the current iteration and the last iteration to update the dz. We can then pass this dz to the second equation. So since dz is known in this case, so this is a constant. And we can also move, because this is also constant, we can move this to the right hand side, which is shown here. So we can solve this equation to get the flow pressure at the nodes. Again, we can do a weighted uh, combination uh, to calculate the P, and we can pass this P back to the first equation uh, to, redo the, to, do, to redo the calculation. So this is the iteration, iteration process. We do this iteration until it converges. Uh, so, you know, uh, those are linear equations. Uh, the, the property of the coefficient matrix is very important uh, to choose the appropriate solver. So for this CLE uh, matrix, it's dense and it's not symmetrical, but there's a very good property, which is the, the entries, the diagonal entries of this coefficient matrix are much larger than the off-diagonal entries. Because as I described previously, this matrix is associated with the green function. Uh, if we're close to the diagonal, 
the which means the distance is relatively short. So the green function is very large. So that's why the uh, diagonal entries are much greater. So in this case, the uh, Gauss silo uh, solver uh, is very efficient. So can, so we can use this solver to uh, solve the linear equations. In the second case, the coefficient matrix is sparse and is symmetrical. We can use the, the common uh, precondition conjugate gradient solver to efficiently solve those equations. So you can see in the stagger solution scheme, we can make full use of the properties of each uh, coefficient matrix and use different solvers to solve each equations efficiently. And we loop around between those two uh, equations until it converges. Uh, in contrast, in the monolithic method, we have to solve those two equations simultaneously. So because this is a nonlinear equation, you can see here, dz is unknown, p is unknown, the times together, and here dz is to the order of three. So this is a nonlinear equation. So we have to use the newton roxton iteration to linearize those two equations. And that's why we got those, this Jacobian matrix. So the property of Jacobian matrix matters a lot to solve the, the, this equation. Because COE is dense and it's not symmetrical. So this entire Jacobian matrix is not, not sparse and it's not symmetrical. Of course, we can use other type of solvers to solve the equations, but it's not sufficient uh, efficient as compared with the PCG solver. And again, there's one more issue because we don't know if the newton roxton iteration converges or not. Uh, here's, so even without apply those two uh, solution schemes to real uh, numerical simulation examples, we prefer the first case, right? And there's a, an example, a very simple example to uh, uh, test the performance of the two solution schemes. Uh, and initial a penny shape frac, and we inject fluid at the center of this fracture. And uh, we can get the analytical solutions in this paper. So those, uh, the figure here shows the simulation results by the staggered method. So you can see this is the initial fracture. And those are the fracture propagation after some time. And the, the numerical uh, results uh, compared with analytical uh, solutions. So under the stag staggered solution scheme, uh, it performs well. However, if we use the monolithic method, it fails. The reason is this Jacobian matrix is ill-conditioned. Why? Because this term is much greater than this one. And it, you know, if a off, the, off diagonal entries are much greater than the diagonal entries, so this, this matrix is basically ill condition, which fails the calculation. So in my specific example, this monolithic method just doesn't work. So here comes the summary. So in this study, we uh, provide a new uh, algorithm to simulate 3D uh, fracture propagation. And we numerically search for the kink and the twist angles. And uh, then we calibrate the propagation distance, distance. So those two steps are based on stresses instead of SIFs. And then we fit a new fracture front uh, based on a, a series of staggered uh, nodes. Uh, so on the second topic, the HM coupling in the context of hydraulic fracturing. So the monolithic scheme that doesn't work, it fails because the uh, Jacobian matrix is ill conditioned. And we recommend the uh, scatter scheme. So I provide uh, some references of, um, about which is related to uh, the talk today and this paper. Most of the contents are included in this paper and, and you, you can refer to this paper uh, if you are interested. So with that, I'll stop here. So thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Shin. Um, you, you've generated a lot of questions, a lot of interest. So let's just let's just dive into them if that's okay. Um, the 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 first series of questions um, were from Joseph Schull, and and Joseph wonders um, he he's wondering about incorporating fluid leak off in this, in into a model like yours, and whether or not the uh, effective stress at the tip is 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 relevant rather than than the, than um, the way you're calculating. Uh, first, leak off is not considered in my model, but in the 
uh, mass conservation. Um, of course, in the mass conservation equation, you can include that. But currently in my study, I didn't consider that. So the effective stress, yes, we use effective stress to actually in the HF coupling process, we use effective stress to drive the propagation of the fractures. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, and, and the next question kind of is related. Um, you, you know, maybe just walk people through how you would in, include uh, fluid viscosity, fluid velocity. Um, I, I think that question was asked before you got into um, your hydraulic fracturing description. So maybe we don't have to follow up too much on that. Um, Ed, Ed Siebritz, um is, is glad to see triangular elements being used in cracks again. Um, uh, it, it doesn't take much to make Ed happy. Uh, does the pedal crack quantity, uh, um, pedal crack, let me, let me see. Does the pedal crack quantity around the parent crack require only stress analysis to compute? Or is some level of material heterogeneity a factor? No, yeah. Um, st um, stress analysis is not enough, as I just described. So, you know, let me just go back here. So you can see, as I explained, so in my algorithm, there's no way to quantify the number of pedal cracks beforehand. So I have to predefine the number of pedal cracks. And also in this case, if it's under uh, one and three mixed mode loading condition, you know, the, the loading condition actually is the same everywhere on this fracture front. But in this case, in the experiment, in this experiment, there's only seven fragments. But why it's not five or it's nine? But yes, I agree that the material height heterogeneity might play a role in this, but this is not considered in my model because I use the isotropic material assumption. Okay. And, and uh, uh, then before, before, before you continue, let's go back to the previous slide, please. This one? The one in hydraulic fracture. If you apply fluid pressure inside a well bore, you create an axial fracture, which is the stress condition. You initiate an axial fracture, not a uh, fracture perpendicular to the well bore, as you're showing. Mm -hmm. Well, those, Ali, those are based on actual experimental data. And, and as you notice, there's a torque applied. And, and I can't recall, but there may even be an, in a starter crack. In, in Dr. Wu's. Yeah, that, that was a uh, lab test done at the University of uh, Georgia Tech um, and involved torque loading. Yeah. 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 Okay, that, that's my test. So I did that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real yeah, tell us. yeah, yeah. Right. So the ways we did is actually, you know, we, um, we drilled the hole. And then we create like in the, the notch, right? And so that's kind of like the initial one. And then before we add the torque, and then we apply uh, the fluid injection actually in that way. And I applied the compression and to the cylinder and to create the initial uh, fracture. And so that is the initial one. That one initial is has to be perpendicular to the axis of the cylinder. And after that, and then we applied the torque at the same time, and then we inject the fluid. So we, that is how to create that to the mixed mode one and the three uh, loading. Yeah. So, so this is you, the real test. Yes, it's the real test in the lab. <laughs> you got a definitive answer to that question, Ali. Um, so, and, and, and Igor, um, I, 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 Igor is, uh, um, interested in a little more elaboration on how you imp implemented um, mode one to three propagation, in, in particular, how pedals are formed and connected to the primary fra fracture. Um, was mesh requirement required? Uh, first, I have to uh, predefine the number of pedal cracks, as I show here is seven. So I have predefined this number. And after doing that, the, the algorithm can do its work. Yeah. The, the, Mesh refinement is automatically finished by the algorithm. Okay, okay, that's good. And then, then a couple of people have asked where this is available. You've given a list of references and 
This talk is also recorded and it'll be made available. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and, 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 and and Igor is also pointing out that you say that paper by charity at all. And, and they, they studied, studied um, 3D fracture propagation using the boundary element, element approach. And, 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 and he's wondering, wondering if it, what, what the substantial differences are from that paper. Mm -hmm. where, where, where do you see? Well, well it, it, you, know, you know, maybe you guys, guys can take, take that one on offline. Off he's just saying, saying that, that, that there's, there's, there's some more, more published there's, there, at all. There's echo. Sorry. John, you have an echo, so please correct that. Uh, not, not much, much I can do, do about, about it. it. Oh, Edward, could you please tell me which one, which reference? I couldn't recall it now. Well, well there is one by Pollard, uh, which which does the same work. Uh, how, how different is this from the work that Pollard did in 2012? Hmm. Is it similar algorithm or is it a new one? I think it's a new one. So basically I would consider the mixed modality. I think that's the major contribution of this work. Well, I mean, they did more than one, two and three. Yes, uh, I can. Mm, so if it's a mixed model. General of Fracture, 2012. So in this case, while well, it's a very general algorithm. So when I, Whenever you apply what kind of uh, loadings, it, it can just do its work. I think this is the major difference with, uh, compared with the previous studies. I have a question. So when you do mod one and mod three uh, uh, fluid couple problem, do you got some challenges of fluid coupling, uh, fluid pressure uh, convergence? How you simulate the fluid flow between those uh, wings? Like when you have mod three twisting. Mm -hmm. Say it again. Uh, when you do mod one and mod three and coupled with the fluid flow, do you find some challenges in how you account for the fluid, uh, fluid transfer between main fracture and the twisting wings? When I simulate the mod one and mod three uh, hydraulic fracture, what, what's the question? How how did I? So, 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 so do you, you notice, notice, do you do notice any, any, any sort of impediment, impediment to flow? Uh, when, when there's kinking and requesting the flow, yeah, the fluid flow. You got some challenges simulating the fluid flow in the mod one and mod uh, mod one and mod three. That, that kind of propagation. I still don't understand the question. Sorry. Okay. Well, I maybe... Yes. So. so, so so, so, so maybe, 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 maybe you guys, guys can communicate directly, directly off. off yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so, so Vasily, long, long, long question. question. Does, does the threat based criterion take into account far field threat? The stress based criterion take into account far field threat? Yes, you can consider that because uh, this is just based, you know, based on the stress field. You can apply any uh, stress field as you want. Yes, it can consider that. So, so if, if, if that actually... Go, go ahead, ahead Silly. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I suppose that um, I exp explained uh, so the, the difference between the criteria and criteria. The stress-based criterion depends on fast field stress, and uh, sieves uh, don't depend on fast fields because uh, they have affinity coefficient. So stress-based criterion and um, oh, uh, but, 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 based criterion, but I guess they the near different results. No, because the, we use near field stress, right? Near field stress is much greater than the far field stress, I guess. Yeah. If you if you go very far away from the fracture tip, yes, I would say the far field stress would influence would influence the result. But we are using the uh, near field stress, which is very close to the fracture tip. Yeah. but you should be very close. Yeah. 
You see, in this model, you are assuming that the minimum principal stress is vertical. So the fracture can continue to grow perpendicular to the minimum principal stress. But if the minimum principal stress is not vertical, then uh, this mode, the fracture still has to reorient itself to, to achieve a direction minimum to perpendicular to minimum principal stress. Yes, here I just draw like a very simple case, but it, we can you can see I here I simulate this curved surface. It, in the HF coupling process, it can be applied to this case. It can adjust this orientation. Yeah, I just use a very very simple example like here to like the main purpose of this topic is to like explore uh, the applicability of different solution schemes. So. Now I can still apply this algorithm to this to the previous more complex uh, geometry. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, 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 so I, I think, think the answer, answer is, is that, 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 that the, the, the fracture, fracture can be at any orientation to any, any of the principal, principal stresses, stresses and, and not necessarily, necessarily aligned with any of them. Um, let's, let's see. And, 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 and Ed Hebrews. Question. Ed, maybe you can just speak up because I'm not sure I can um, express this adequately. Yes, uh, I'm just curious when you do this FEM fluid coupling, how do you deal with the cracked tip? Because my, my recollection is the uh, fluid pressure is more or less infinite at the, unless you have an explicit fluid lag at the cracked tip. Right, and that's a very good question. I actually uh, extended this mesh a little bit and now apply the uh, far field uh, flow pressure. Such as in this case, I, I extended the mesh and at some distance away I here apply the zero pressure condition. Okay. Yeah. And then per per Professor, Professor Farid, Farid Ali is, is, is interested in um, uh, about, about whether or not you've extended this to non-isothermal situations that should be thermal. Um, yes, I did some work to study the uh, a THM coupling in a geothermal case. Mm. In but in currently, I don't engage temperature in this study. Okay. Yeah. Did you, did you publish, publish that, that anywhere, anywhere or, or is it in, in the work? work? Sorry? Did, did you publish, publish that geothermal information anywhere? Yes, up here you can see this paper. Mm. Let me see this one, the um, publishing mining size, the uh, 3D thermal hydromechanical coupling for geothermal uh -huh. system. If you're cool. interested, you can go to this paper. Yeah. Cool. cool. And, and uh, uh, Darman, um, in, in, enjoyed, enjoyed work, work um, and he's asking in the uh, stress intensity factor based method, method that you mentioned about system level iterations. iterations. Um, what, what is uh, why, why are these iterations, iterations required? Because uh, we under this the uh, the Skolman criteria, the fracture propagates when this KV, uh, KV is, is greater than KIC. So the system level iteration is to obtain a line where uh, KV is equal to KIC. Because initially we are using this equation to roughly estimate the propagation distance. It's not accurate. So we are start, we start with this line. And as the iteration goes on, this, this line gradually approaches this line, the dashed line where KV is equal to KIC. That's why the system level iteration is carried out. So uh, what you change during system uh, iteration, basically you are finding the time. What are you finding the geometry? What part uh, you do it's the system iteration, you are changing your uh, injection changing, time or you change the changing, changing the propagation distance here. Propagation distance. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, both ways we can do whether we change the time or we can do the uh, the distance. But but what do you think? Did you try sometime to initially fix the distance and then find the difference time? Mm, if, you, if, you do the, if you do that way, convergence is, uh, usually is fast as compared to changing the distance. So, so basically, case, hydraulic pressure problem you can do two way. Whether you 
extend your geometry mm -hmm. and then find the corresponding time. Otherwise, you, uh, uh, you uh, extend geometry, find the time. In other case, you fix the time and find the geometry. Well, so other way, other way is more convenient. But you advance the geometry and then find the corresponding time. Then yeah, I think well, you will get the, uh, this convergence issue. What is the yeah, point? yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I understand you. But this is okay. this is not a hydraulic fracturing problem. In this case, it's only uh in the solid. There's no fluid, so there's no parameter of time in this case. Okay, understand. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's fine. Okay. okay. Thank you. And then, 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 then um, Ben, ben remarks he yeah. um, enjoyed, enjoyed the presentation, and he's, he's wondering, wondering since, since uh, finite elements, elements uh, are, are used for the flow, does this, this impact, impact the mass balance, balance calculation? calculation? I I don't know exactly what you mean by uh, impact of the mass balance. I yeah, so those two are. Uh, Mass balance do do mean the mass conservation or do mean the stress equation? Oh yes, it's a mass conservation. Yeah, mass conservation. Why would it impact the mass conservation equation? Because I start from the PDE and they use use the very standard FEM approximation. Why would you think uh, that? Would but but your FEM or uh, pressure I know is associated with the node, right? That which is not the mass balance actually. In the F, I think you, I think you are comparing with FV, FVM, right? Right. Well, it's a different way to approximate this. I guess the weak form, and as best as I know, if we the standard FEM process can actually deal with this situation, I think it's still the mass conservation still holds. Okay, so you uh just just the standard FEM is used, uh, no like a special treatment, right? For for this kind. No. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um. Then I, I think, think that's. that's uh, I mean, there was um. Ben had one more question. You wanted to know what the spatial element criterion and, and hydraulic mechanical coupling are both implemented, implemented in the DDS. Yes. No, no, DDFS 3D is mainly calculates uh, the, the fractures that, that so you provide the geometry, it can calculate the uh, displacement discontinuity. The fracture propagation part and the HL, uh, HM coupling part uh, has not been added to uh, this code yet. No, no that, that, that's, that's the extent of the, the, the question. Is, um, can, can, I, can I ask one question for clarification? Yeah, sure. sure. There, there was a mention of uh, using effective stress for propagation. I, yeah. To my knowledge, the fracture propagation is controlled by total stress, not effective. So why, why effective stress would be used? Um, well, maybe you mean my, that pressure. Well, in my case, uh, in this case, it's not a power medium. I, I would say it's there's only pressure inside the fracture. Right. Yeah. I uh, just. You, I think, think Professor Cassini is agreeing with you. Is what? Is agreeing, agreeing with, with you. you. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm saying, yeah, so th there was a mention of effective stress being used, and I was saying, well, that can't be because, you know, total stress is what propagates fractures, not effective, so. Yeah, yeah, in this, yeah, in this case, I just used, like, the inner pressure to drive the fracture propagation, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah thanks. Hmm. Hey, hey, um, uh, hey, Shin, Shin this, 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 this was, was superb. superb. Um, you, you really, really got, got people thinking, and it's, it's, it's a very nice, nice piece of numerical work. work. And, and so, so um, we, we'd, we'd really, really like to thank, thank you sincerely for making this presentation. Thank you. Okay, as the request, I'll, I'll uh, send the, the PDF version of this uh, slides to make okay. it happen. You can distribute it to the audience, wherever okay. is interested. Yeah, very, very, very good. good. And, and we'll also post uh, um, a video so people can have a voiceover. Okay. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
Shin, that, that was, was a very, very nice, nice job. job. Thanks, Thanks for, for doing, doing it. it. Thank you very much. Hey, John, you can perhaps stop the recording, right? So that we can. I'm going to have to run another meeting. I, I, I can. Let me just see. Stop the recording.